Bon, je pense qu'on peut commencer la séance. Donc. I think we can actually begin our session. I'd like to welcome all of you. Welcome to this session, which is called uh, Selling uh, to China and Throughout Asia. The Hong Kong Trade Development Council has organized the uh, overall seminar. During this session, you'll be hearing from five speakers five uh, presentations. After that, we'll have 50 minutes discussion and Q&A. Let me tell you who I am. I'm Paul Claire Renault, uh, Managing Director from a group. Uh, our group has been in Hong Kong for 35 years now. From Hong Kong, we've developed business activities throughout the region, opened offices and subsidiaries in China, of course, but also in Vietnam and in India, uh, but all of this via Hong Kong, which we continue to use as our strategic, operational, financial, legal base. This afternoon's subject is how to use Hong Kong to tackle the Chinese market and regional markets. As we said this morning, there is very substantial French presence in Hong Kong. Most French uh, companies in Hong Kong work regionally. Some of them have a global footprint. Schneider's uh, HQ is in Hong Kong now. As we heard this morning, Hong Kong has 17,000 uh, French people there. The Chamber of Commerce, or the European Chamber of Commerce, has over 1,000 members. It's the biggest one offering uh, a whole range of services for businesses who'd like to establish. Particularly, there's a business center where these companies can uh, establish offices, and they have the requisite uh, services available to them. There's an employment office to assist in hiring employees, also helping French people who are looking for jobs in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, as we heard this morning, there's a French lycée, which is highly active, a very dynamic lycée, some uh, 2,200 students, uh, an office from the, uh, foreign, uh, the foreign trade office, and uh, France has an office in Hong Kong as well that can assist you, UB France. In addition to this, there are various Hong Kong associations that are extremely efficient. You'll have certainly seen that today, the Hong Kong Trade Development Council. When they do things, they do them very efficiently. Of course, they can assist you, uh, assist you in Hong Kong and accommodate you there. They can also help you in the Chinese market. They've got about 15 offices in China that are very active. And there's an Invest Hong Kong. Simon uh, Galpin will be speaking to you later and taking part in the discussion. He's um, the Director General of Invest Hong Kong. There's Science Park as well with uh, technical scientific infrastructure available uh, to uh, companies in that industry. There's also Cyberport, the equivalent of Science Park, but for um, IT companies, information technology companies. There are also uh, organizations of the tourism board. There are, these can be very active and important partners in various sectors such as food, catering, Hong Kong tourism, which as we've said, is a very important portion of the Hong Kong economy. And we know that um, many of our luxury companies are particularly interested in that industry. You'll be hearing uh, from five speakers. Our speakers are a good representation of French success stories in Hong Kong in very uh, different types of uh, industry. First of all, you hear from Igor Duke, who is managing director of Native Union Hong Kong. He'll be talking to you about Hong Kong as a base for an innovative brand combining design and lifestyle technology. Next, you'll hear from Jacques Boissier, who's uh, also been in Hong Kong for quite some time. He's managing director of Classic Fine Foods. He'll be talking to you about Hong Kong as a platform for distribution of um, premium food products in China. 
Next, we'll hear from Cecile Osela, Asia-Pacific Dresser, uh, Director of Kodali. She'll talk to you about Hong Kong as a showcase for Asia of um, lifestyle products. After that, you'll hear from Ms. Ariane Zaguri. Ariane uh, is a businesswoman. She's a businesswoman. She's very dynamic. She's the chief executive officer of Rue Madame that she set up after having a career in banking. She'll talk about Hong Kong as a location where you can create your business, particularly talking to you about uh, the luxury and fashion industry. And then last but not least, we'll be hearing from Simon Galpin, as I said to you, Director General of Investment Promotion uh, to Invest Hong Kong. He'll talk about Hong Kong and its attractiveness as um, a place for investment and uh, creation of companies. First of all, I'd ask Igor Duke to please come to the stage. Igor went to the SPC Paris and Management University in Singapore before then setting up his first company at the age of 23 in um, furniture sector. He started in 04, then and after that he just had to go to Hong Kong in 2007 to manage uh, the uh, supplies for his company. That's where he met with his current partner. And together with that partner, he established Native Union, which is an innovative brand of high-tech uh, premium accessories. A wonderful adventure. Igor, tell us a little bit more about how this all came about. Merci, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon to you all. Let me say that it's a real honor for me to have been invited to be able to talk to you about how Hong Kong as a city gave me an opportunity, gave me the wherewithal to build Native Union, which is, one is an ambitious project. It's uh, just six years old now. We'll talk to you a lot during our session of um, administrative simplicity, uh, a very positive environment to develop a company. But we mustn't forget really the most important thing to my mind, which is fairly unique in Hong Kong. This city gives you the strength and the energy that you need to move forward. It has high energy entrepreneurs and uh, citizens. I think in Hong Kong we can move forward quite quickly and even faster than elsewhere, and I'll explain to you why during my presentation. To begin with, in the first part uh, of my talk, I'd like to talk to you about the unique environment in Hong Kong. And I would say that there's this great pool of talent in Hong Kong from throughout the world that help you to build, design a company and or brand. There's a great deal of synergy. Think back 10 years ago. Back then you had to import your talent. It was expensive to do so, complicated to import talented people to Hong Kong, and you had to pay them to come to Hong Kong. Today, things have turned around completely. People uh, really want to get experience which means that we as business people have available to us locally highly talented people from all over the world. Some countries tend to uh, excel in certain things in Europe, certain things. Today we've got 38 employees and we've got 20 from Hong Kong. The remainder, we've got people from the UK, from Spain, from Japan, from Malaysia, from Sweden, <coughs> we have people from France, and so on and so forth. So we can say that it's truly an international environment, and it's great at the very beginning to have people from uh, all countries worldwide, and this is of paramount importance. This currently isn't the only location worldwide where you can find as much foreign talent, but it's certainly one of them. And there's something really amazing in Hong, in Hong Kong, which I can't explain, but this whole blend works beautifully. You can see something similar in New York. You know, a lot of times when you bring together lots of different cultures, religions, and nationalities, you end up with separate groups, sort of clans, and sometimes some friction. And yesterday, I was worrying about this again. I don't have an answer as to why it, the blend works out so beautifully in Hong Kong, but it does. It does. Everything comes together quite well. And as we see it, 
this is very much part and parcel of our brand, part of our genetic makeup. We've got these people that come together, it all gels, having this very international base. A second point, which I view as a very important one, Hong Kong is very close, about an hour away from mainland China. Mainland China, as you know, is uh, the, the biggest uh, source worldwide of manufacturers, of suppliers. Often, you'll see Chinese factories um, as a little bit old-fashioned, as just suppliers. That's how you view them. You would just expect to just give them a project and expect them to move on that. Things have changed. Those factories today have changed, moved forward. Often they've got Western management, they've got a great deal of engineering on board, which means just one year, well, one, sorry, one hour away from the center of Hong Kong, the time it would take to, for, to get from the Louvre to the Wasi Airport, Charles de Gaulle Airport, you've got this other world where almost everything's possible. Very important for us because we're in a highly competitive industry. We're making accessories for technology today, so for cell phones, um, tablets, computers. So to have this positioning, high-end, premium, innovative, cutting edge, is very, very important. Sometimes people don't realize why it's so important to be close to China. When you're close to China, you can reap the benefits of this. Let me just give you an example, something that happened six months ago. We were going to China to visit one of our suppliers, and as it so happens, we made a mistake. We took the wrong road and got to another factory. That other factory was making shoes for a major, a major brand. We spent about an hour there. I was with a designer, and we at that time discovered a new technology they were using. They were injecting this resin into a fabric, so we left that plant with a new idea. And it's a new type of protection that we're launching now, the most protective one, based on this technology which we discovered in China. We're also developing a composite material that's uh, made of marble, very fine marble, of course. In technology, you usually don't use marble because it's heavy. But we made requests in Germany and in France and also the same in China to ask to find out which country would make it possible for us to really make a breakthrough? Well, it turns out to be in China, where we find the, uh, found the best technology to do these slices of marble of 0.8 millimeters that can be used then to develop the product we're working on. My point is, this way, it's almost possible to do miracles. China being right alongside Hong Kong is a catalyst for miracles. When you're an innovative company, this means everyone working in your company can accept any project, view it as a challenge, take it on board. Just three days ago, we had an opportunity uh, to do a pop-up at the Hong Kong airport for October 31st. We had just uh, five days to do the project, make the furniture and so forth, and set it all up. We have a metal supplier right near our office. We have a wood supplier right near our office. So in three days' time, we're able to make that pop-up anywhere else worldwide, any other location. People would have panicked. And probably they would have said, no, they can't do it. Not possible. We can't do that. In Hong Kong, almost anything is possible. That's the impression you have, certainly, that everything, anything's possible in Hong Kong. Very important for our teams to know that those opportunities are out there. Hong Kong, a base for lifestyle products to penetrate not just the Chinese uh, market, but foreign markets. Let me say that Hong Kong consumers are uh, shopping professionals. Sometimes we receive resumes from people where they will include under their leisure time um, shopping. And some of them even call it a sport activity, uh, shopping. So we're talking about people who are ready to consume. There's a, that local market right there in Hong Kong. You've got uh, seven million inhabitants right at your doorstep. So even just if you're an international brand, we are, we've got 35 countries. It's a wonderful laboratory in China, Hong Kong to test your products. Next point, Hong Kong. To come back to points I've made previously, it's a territory where it's easy to create companies. Um, you've got a lot of talented people locally. You've got suppliers within an hour of Hong Kong that can make basically any type of product for you. So logically, the next thing that should happen, and it is happening, the rest of the world, such as the Americans and the Europeans, are now looking at Hong Kong, not just for production, but also for design. There are brands, lots of brands today that are being created in um, Hong Kong. Think of oil, um, watches, Norwegian, think of Mishai, uh, handbag brand, and so forth. 
They are very proud to be Hong Kong design brands. This is new. Previously, people would hide the fact. They didn't dare say. Um, I'm French. My partner's British. We could have said we're a Franco-British company. We don't. We're proud to say that we are made in Hong Kong. We're a company that was born in Hong Kong. This has attracted a lot of venture capitalists, um, uh, a lot of startup businesses, people who want to help startups that come to Hong Kong to look at new projects, look at new products, new brands. That's a new phenomenon that we're seeing. So how can you use Hong Kong as headquarters, basically, to get a brand off the ground, to launch a brand? It's perfectly logical. Today, Hong Kong, we said it this morning, is a financial center. Hong Kong has a whole uh, pool of local talent, so you don't need to have expatriates. Uh, we've also got a whole series, an array of suppliers right near Hong Kong. Hong Kong is also a harbor for exporting products. I don't think of any equivalent example today, any other location where you can develop your brand this way. In a presentation, I talked about cost effectiveness. It's important. When you start a company, you can't do everything at the same time. When you've got everything clustered in the same locale, that means with limited resources, you can coordinate basically all the company's new departments and probably move ahead a lot faster than would be the case if you set up the same company in France, where whatever happens, you've got to work with an Asian manufacturer. One more minute. I have. Another very important point, something that's new again, and we see this all the time. People are coming to Hong Kong now. First of all, there are a lot of fairs, trade fairs and so forth. There's the wine fair, um, there's the electronics fair, the cosmetics uh, trade show. And then in December, there's a big design uh, trade show. It'll be the biggest design innovation uh, show in Asia. So purchasers are coming to Hong Kong. Previously, when you were based in Hong Kong, one of the main drawbacks was that you had to go elsewhere to meet with your clients. Now your clients come to you. They come to us more and more. You get the impression that all roads lead to Hong Kong now. Maybe they don't all come for job-related reasons, but they end up as they're traveling throughout the region, they'll make a stop over in Hong Kong and meet with us. Think of Best Buy. They met with us uh, last week. Previously, we had to go to Minneapolis to meet with them. That's extra cost, more time, investment. Now these people are coming to Hong Kong. They're coming looking for novelties in Hong Kong. So seriously, the future looks very, very bright to me in this area of creativity in Hong Kong. And one last important point. When you create a company, Often you make concessions, cut corners, have to make sacrifices. You don't get to meet your, see your family and friends very often. But when you're in Hong Kong, it's a different situation. I can really trust Hong Kong. I can really, it's like having a trusted person. It's a city I trust. It's a city that makes it possible for us to actually move on to the next stage and future stages. And now we have every intention to really go global. Even more will continue to be located in Hong Kong, a Hong Kong brand. We're not going to be the only ones. And there you have it. I think the future is very bright for Hong Kong. And I would invite everyone to uh, become interested and possibly do the same thing in Hong Kong. Thank you. Merci, Igor. Uh, Thank you, Igor. Sorry, we have to be very strict about timing because we need some time for questions and answers. It was very fascinating, but um, unfortunately, we have to move over to the next item. After high tech and shopping, we'll talk about food, gastronomy, with uh, Jacques Boissier, thanks to whom we have uh, access to the best food in the world in Hong Kong, including French restaurants, uh, for instance, with uh, Joël Rebuchon and others, other chefs. Uh, Jacques Boissier started to uh, work for the uh, SCOA group in 1973, he was very young then. He uh, had managing um, 
duties for various uh, firms. He arrived in '93 in Hong Kong, and he managed. Uh, he was uh, promoted at the head of the uh, Olivier Group, and in 2000, he uh, was re he became responsible for the gastronomic, French gastronomic food. And uh, in distribution fine food, he is responsible for Greater China. This group is re represented now in 13 uh, countries in Asia and Europe. And it imports uh, French and European food uh, in hotel, restaurants, and supermarkets in uh, Hong Kong. Jacques is also um, very busy in the business French business community. He's a member of the uh, board of the Chamber of Commerce, executive board of the uh, Chamber of Commerce, and he's a member of the uh, external board as well. So he's going to share his wide-ranging experience in his presentation. So I have been introduced uh, very, uh, uh, with very flattering words. I'm going to be brief. We all need creators, and, and thanks uh, to the creators in Hong Kong, the um, business leaders, the large companies, it's thanks to those people uh, that we um, are successful in our company because we feed uh, them. I've been in Hong Kong for 22 years. Uh, I used to be uh, to work for 16 years in Africa. I must admit I've been happier in Hong Kong than in Africa. And within our group, I'm responsible for Greater China, that is to say uh, Hong Kong, which is our main company, Macau as well, where we uh, started to develop a few years ago, and China more recently. I'm going to talk about this, those three uh, business lines. In Hong Kong, we distribute premium or high-end uh, pr uh, products from France, Italy, Spain, and also Australia because we can find uh, premium food in Australia and premium products in Australia. And we are beginning to import food from China to export to other countries because China uh, is uh, changing very rapidly. China is producing, uh, is starting to produce a very uh, high and or high quality uh, vegetable in non-polluted areas. For instance, in France, we eat, we are starting to eat more and more as asparagus and uh, mushrooms from uh, China, and what we call the Paris mushrooms come mo mostly from uh, China. We use uh, logistical platforms. We import fresh produce three times a week from France, like oysters, vegetable, meat, fish. We have a cold chain, which is quite complex, sophisticated uh, product, which uh, starts uh, at noon on Tuesday from Paris is going to uh, arrive uh, to the customer by Thursday afternoon. We have warehouses in uh, each of our facility at a very low temperature for frozen food, minus 18, zero degree for f uh, degrees for f uh, meat, plus seven or eight for vegetable and fruit. And uh, also we have a, a specific uh, conditions for dry produce and uh, pastries. So it's a marketing business and logistical activity. Our customers come from um, hotels, catering, uh, restaurants, catering, or uh, people include people who are going to process products, for instance, um, people who will manufacture pastry, industrial pastries and sandwiches. Airlines are major customers, cruise uh, ships as well. And we also sell in some countries, for instance in Hong Kong, to the large retailers. Uh, for instance, uh, President is a well-known uh, French brand that we sell in the supermarket in Hong Kong and also high-end um, shops, food shops. In Hong Kong, we have a lot of high-end food shops. And this is very comparable to Lafayette Gourmet in Paris. The same standards are complied with. Uh, but uh, there is a wide range of uh, a product uh, with uh, uh, products coming from uh, all origins. We've uh, talked this morning about Hong Kong's success. In, we can find them in the food consumption. In Hong Kong, there are uh, 
restaurants with several stars, and a, a, a Michelin guide has been published in Hong Kong, which is evidence of the high quality of our uh, restaurant uh, owners, of our chefs. Robichon uh, is uh, established in Hong Kong, and uh, people in Hong Kong spend a lot and live well. Our company uh, is quite young, has been uh, set up 14 years ago and is established in 14 countries, mainly in Asia, but also in Dubai and London, with a logistical platform or, or logistical hub in Paris. 18 um, people in all uh, are employed in Paris for fresh produce. So from uh, Hong Kong in Asia, we have managed to uh, further our develop development in, all, in uh, a lot of countries. 14 years ago, we have taken over a, a 14 a staff uh, a company, and uh, now we have 120 employees. We haven't mentioned Macau, but it's a major center for some uh, um, activities. We have uh, set up a company eight years ago. We have 18 employees in Macau with the warehouses, and uh, our main customers are casinos, uh, gambling houses. Uh, it represent, Macau represents uh, three to four times the, uh, the casino or gambling house uh, turnover of Las Vegas. Macau is a major gambling center, and people uh, consume a lot in Macau. It's an interesting country uh, concerning luxury and high-end fruit products. Two years ago, we have uh, set up a company or taken over two companies in China, one in Shanghai and one in Beijing, and we have a distribution network in China. I'll come back later to China and its uh, challenges, challenges that we have to take up, and uh, it's very exciting. In Shanghai, we have 45 people or employees working there. Those are Hong Kong subsidiaries. In Macau, we have nobody in the back office. Back office is uh, dealt with by uh, Hong Kong employees, so as uh, um, finance, back office activities are concerned. And we have found very high level uh, employees in Hong Kong, in Macau human resources are scarce, and uh, all the high-level people are um, hired by the gambling houses. I have multilingual employees who know how to work in foreign countries. They have very good corporate culture, uh, very high-level corporate culture, and they support our development. It's true concerning finance, logistical issues. We have a supply chain manager in Hong Kong who helps us training uh, to train uh, people in Hong Kong. So we hire um, Hong Kong people speaking Mandarin. We manage our human resources from Hong Kong with very good professionals. In China, we manage to find high quality employees, but not in, in China. It's uh, thanks to recruitment or hiring uh, office or hiring firm, uh, which uh, works both in Hong Kong and in China. Sort of a head hunting office. So why Hong Kong? Well, because it's easy to work there. The legislation is very clear-cut and uh, sophisticated, and it is very helpful if we want to work in China. The legal uh, skills uh, are in Hong Kong. We work with Hong Kong lawyers in order to operate in China. As, um, um, the uh, Chinese employees are trained by our people. In Hong Kong, we used to have people uh, who were experts in meat or fish, so um, uh, product uh, technicians, and uh, they help us to uh, give us the necessary support in China. Uh, China is still quite underdeveloped. It's very difficult to find a pastry expert in Beijing. And if you find him uh, two years later, he will find a better paying job in cosmetics. Another reason why we like it in Hong Kong, it's the life quality. It's less polluted than in China, even though sometimes we get uh, pollution from China. Uh, but it's a very uh, nice uh, uh, life that we lead there. 
And uh, when I arrive in the Hong Kong airport uh, in order to spend three uh, days in um, uh, China, I feel a lot of energy flowing. And uh, it's very easy. This energy helps us to uh, take up the challenges. Financial market, it's very easy from Hong Kong to invest in China. So somebody asked the question this morning, do we need a partner or not? We chose not to find a partner. Why? Because it makes it easier to control companies. Entrepreneurship is difficult in China. If you have, uh, if you set up a partnership with a Chinese uh, a company, uh, they will think it their company, a Chinese company, and not your company. One of the difficulties that we've met in China, somebody mentioned uh, the ne the uh, need to have high level products. Yes, indeed, it's not possible to export. Um, trivial, uh, commonplace products. So we look for high-tech products or technical products. We really need uh, to export to China added value products, services as far as uh, uh, cold chain is concerned and uh, as far as expertise in technical issues uh, is uh, concerned. Our difficulties mostly legal how to register products, the regulations change all the time, and they can be interpreted in various ways. We have set up an entity uh, whereby we can import all our products uh, to Shanghai, but we pay it from, in Hong Kong, we pay our suppliers. Kofas um, is more uh, willing uh, to uh, give a policy, an insurance policy, to a company which is headquartered in Hong Kong than in China. So difficult legislation. I was talking about product re registration rules from the time when I decide to import a product and uh, the time when it's actually on uh, the market. I need uh, between uh, six and nine months, and I'm talking about simple products. Another product, another difficulty in China, the cold chain in Beijing. We are not entitled to use a refrigerated truck in during the day. So our competitors are going to uh, deliver um, cold, uh, frozen food on a, uh, on a motorbike. So we try to use a truck. Anyway, we try to cheat or circumvent the, re the regulations. But in Hong Kong, we have very uh, skilled people who are going to train uh, the Chinese employees. Now, in conclusion, I would like to say that Hong Kong is the best place uh, to be headquartered in and to invest in China. That's quite clear. There is an agreement between China and Hong Kong called CEPAL that we do not uh, use closer economic partnership arrangement. Uh, we've been uh, assisted uh, um, in that way to improve our knowledge of China, of, of China. In Hong Kong, you can meet a lot of Chinese uh, who can help you. It's not as true in uh, China, where they, you're a little bit lost. Human resources, it's a main uh, asset in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, there is a problem with unskilled uh, uh, employees. It's difficult to find a driver in Hong Kong or a, a uh, warehouse um, manager. However, if you look in Hong Kong for a, a high-level executive or supervisor, then you can find very high, highly skilled people who are willing to uh, go to China for a, um, temp on a temporary basis. Our bankers are in Hong Kong. We do not work with Chinese banks, but with Hong Kong uh, banks. They know how to manage flows. We fund all our uh, transactions with China from uh, Hong Kong, which is easier because payments from China are quite complicated. We have mentioned the issue of dividend. It's practically impossible to repatriate dividends from China in our business. When I send the products to China. 
uh, customers will uh, pay after 90 days. But anyway, I need six months before the products are paid for. So the, to, to work with the Hong Kong banks, uh, which is quite knowledgeable about those difficulties, is an asset. So I can only uh, praise Hong Kong. And of course, if you want, I can share some of my uh, experience concerning the agri-food business in China. I think it's a growing country. As far as agri-food industry is concerned, Hong Kong is the largest market in Asia, even larger uh, than China. But China is a growing market. I think that uh, for the agri-food market, luxury um, agri-food market, China is the equivalent of the Hong Kong market 10 years ago. However, China is growing much more quickly than any other market, and I think that in four or five years' time, we will get there. So it's time to go. Thank you. After talking about food, we'll move into another very pleasant uh, industry, beauty. I'd like to ask up to the rostrum uh, Cecile Osela, who's regional manager of uh, Côte d'Ali for Asia. She began working at Clarence and Cicle in the beauty sector, before then going to the LVMH group in Hong Kong in 2007. In 2009, when the founders of Côte d'Ali, Martin Botrinoma, uh, suggested she come on board to help boost its Asian development, of course, she had to say yes to that challenge. So she set up the regional Hong Kong office, starting uh, retailing in Northern Asia. After developing markets in China and Korea, she then focused on Hong Kong, a showcase uh, for Asia, opening the first Kodari Spa uh, boutique in a sophisticated neighborhood in Hong Kong. Just to, uh, I'd like to specify one thing, Cecile is speaking on her own behalf, not on behalf of Kodali. So she'll be able to uh, talk to us about her personal experience. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good afternoon. I'll be talking to you about uh, the following topic today, Hong Kong as a showcase for the Asian region. I'm, uh, I focused to begin with on uh, China and Korea. These were big markets. And then I realized afterwards I needed to focus on Hong Kong because it serves as a true showcase for us, for uh, all of our regional development for our brand. Now, the first thing we have to realize, and since this morning we've talked about this subject a lot, but Hong Kong is a very efficient city that really is designed for business. Hong Kong ranks fourth worldwide today in terms of economic momentum. It's very dynamic, and it's a strategic location to develop your regional office. The first advantage in Hong Kong is its central location, its positioning, and its regional influence. Luxury consumption has shifted toward China and also to new emerging uh, Southeast Asian countries. Hong Kong is right at the center, ge geographically speaking, of the two high potential regions. Also, Hong Kong has a highly effective infrastructure. Believe you me, when you travel every single week, it is really pleasant to uh, come back to an airport that's comfortable, that serves all cities worldwide, an airport that you can get to from the center of Hong Kong in just 25 minutes' time through a train. You don't have to worry about strikes or worry about missing your plane. So you can uh, minimize the amount of time you spend getting to and from the airport. So once you've gotten used to that, you wish it could be like that everywhere else in the world. Next, to talk about the economic environment in Hong Kong. We've already said this today, but I'll repeat it. It's a liberal environment, and it's facilitated. Administration is facilitated in Hong Kong. No cumbersomeness to the Hong Kong administration. Easy to set up an office in Hong Kong. It just takes a few hours' time. If you want to set up a representation office, beginning with the lightweight uh, structure, you can do so. That way, you can get down to your business uh, with payment from France paying all of your service providers from France. After your structure, that's what we did at Codetti. Once your structure gets a little bit more complex and you employ more and more people, you then will need to uh, set up a limited structure. 
That's easy as well. You can set it up in record time. Managing your subsidiary will be easy and effective uh, in the Hong Kong style. Also, the legal framework is um, common law simplified. When I began in China and Korea, I can tell you uh, Chinese and Korean contracts, you have to work with lawyers, and it's hard to understand the contracts. It's, it's not all very transparent sometimes. Whereas in Hong Kong, it's more a like common law type framework, and that makes things much more straightforward. And that's less of an impediment to develop your business. Another important point, I was um, alone to move on this one. I didn't have the support of LVMH or some major corporation for my visa. And I got my visa in three weeks. It's um, easy to get your visa there your approval. A lot of organizations and so forth can assist you to get your authorization. I used the Chamber of Commerce to get the go-ahead, and they assisted me, uh, a tailor-made process for me to go through the administrative process to get um, administrative approval. I have two employees, French, two French, 11 employees in all, two French, and we all managed uh, to get our papers quite easily and quite quickly. This is important when you want to set up a business to get visas and documents easily. Next, Hong Kong is all about networking. It's small, and when it's small, it's easy to know a lot of people. It's easy to network there and get assistance. In um, my business, basically, all the regional offices are located in Hong Kong. And it's therefore very easy for me to work with various general managers, to meet with them, to have discussions with them. And uh, people also like to help you out. They talk to you about uh, opportunities and um, issues there can be and so forth. A lot of organizations will assist you. They're out there to organize, I don't know, uh, cocktail parties, meetings with other businesses. Um, there's Invest Hong Kong. There's also the um, HKTC, uh, the Chamber of Commerce. Now there are 17,000 French, 750 French businesses in Hong Kong. So there are fellow citizens. There are other French people out there. There's a real French community and a community spirit that's very much coming to the fore. So that's the point on networking. Now I'd like to talk about the strategic platform. Uh, which is Hong Kong, to reach mainland China. Hong Kong is uh, very attractive to tourists as well. First and foremost, Hong Kong is a fascinating city. If you haven't yet had the opportunity of going there, I would certainly advise you to go. It's got such energy, great architecture, culture. And there are so many different activities available there. It's really like Paris. It's a place you must go to at least once in your life. That's true of any type of tourist. But of course, what we're interested in is Chinese tourists, more specifically. Hong Kong has a competitive edge uh, compared to China. First of all, proximity. They can get to Hong Kong quite quickly uh, from China. And they're very, they've got a great deal of trust, uh, high confidence in the Hong Kong products. Uh, they know that it's a clean distribution network in Hong Kong. Also, prices are attractive, tax-free, so which makes things 20 to 30 percent cheaper than mainland China. It's a small city. Uh, these are serial shoppers that come. They've got their whole lists of things to, to purchase, and they like to be able to go to many different stores in a half hour's time. They have to be the one they're, they're interested in Hong Kong efficiency in this respect as well. And the Chinese feel very much at home in Hong Kong, and they feel very welcome in Hong Kong since they are at home. A couple of figures, I'm sure you've heard them several times since this morning. 75% of tourists are Chinese. That's a big proportion, 55 million visitors per year. That's basically the size of France. And this uh, figure continues to increase. China is evolving and getting richer all the time. Chinese spend around uh, 5,000 RMB each time they come. Multiply that by 55 uh, million visitors. So you can well imagine Hong Kong uh, certainly is the future of retailing. A recent survey shows us that by 2025, Hong Kong should be the first retail platform worldwide, at least in the cosmetics industry. So you must use Hong Kong. How? Hong Kong needs to be used as a test market. It needs to be used as a laboratory for Asia. The Hong Kong market will really bring you upward and forward. Why? because you've got a whole range of local consumers who are highly sophisticated, elegant, demanding, who will make you tailor your offering. 
who will make you increase the quality of your services to reach Asian levels. There are service providers from many different companies that will understand you and will understand your requirements because they have a great deal of Asian experience, whether you're talking about IT, web, digital, design. All these companies often provide local support and various regional support solutions, for instance, uh, to go to China. They're all experts in China. Also in Hong Kong, you've got high media impact. Even the press will give you good regional, regional visibility. We organize quarterly events and we invite Hong Kong press. Often, 80% of the time, Hong Kong magazines will send on this information to Chinese offices, which will also give coverage, and that's very important. Lastly, um, employee culture. You've got a real choice of uh, applicants. The twofold Chinese um, Western culture gives greater flexibility, gives greater momentum to move on to the role of Hong Kong in developing your company, challenges and opportunities. You've got to use Hong Kong as a receptive, welcoming city. Use all of its resources to bring in key people. Use Hong Kong as your calling card where you invite your clients, where you invite uh, journalists. They love Hong Kong. They love to shop there, go out there, spend um, a wonderful time there, and write a great article on you using the various digital platforms and social media, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Weibo, WeChat, and so forth. And use this is incentive to your teams as well to welcome them in Hong Kong. They'll feel flattered. The Koreans, the Chinese, they're always pleased to have a stay in Hong Kong. You can also use this great infrastructure, an ideal infrastructure in Hong Kong, to organize regional seminars, inviting um, retailers, uh, teams, and so forth, and they're all pleased to come. Wrong slide. In Hong Kong, you'll find a diverse pool of employees. We keep saying this, but it's an important point. If you want to have a regional impact, you've got to have regional talents. You've got to have Chinese talent, local talent, many talented employees. Hong Kong is considered to be an El Dorado, even for the French. It's economy, it's full employment, it's energy. You feel safe, you can go out in the street. I've even left my bag at a discotheque and I was called the next morning. Someone told me they'd found it. So there's, there's no such thing as theft. There's no violence, aggressiveness. There's great cultural diversity, lots of sporting events. You can get away for the weekend. It's a high-pressure city. Yes, lots of energy, but on the weekend, you can go hiking, you can go to the beach. It's a moderate climate, very pleasant. So this is attracting more and more talented people from throughout Asia, Korea, Singapore, Japan. They're very interested in uh, working in the country. There's a whole range of candidates, some um, diverse, many different profiles, and this is a real plus point for any company. And the Hong Kong, in turn, they've got a twofold culture, so they've got a quick understanding of your corporate culture. Not always easy to understand a French corporate culture. We're constantly challenging them. And this makes it easier uh, to act as an interface with France. Then you've got, um, uh, there are often people that speak three languages, they speak Mandarin, Cantonese, and English. That makes it easier for you to be in touch with the Chinese market, Hong Kong market, uh, and have discussions with other markets internationally. Now the difficult thing is to come up with your business model. It's, of course, everyone's a difficulty. First of all, um, to adapt your distribution process, and you can't just replicate your distribution model from Europe or France. Distribution models are different uh, in Asia, and the idea of service in Hong Kong is key. Service is of paramount importance throughout Asia, and the consumer experience is very important. Image is very important. You can have them. All the major brand flagships are in Hong Kong. All the majors are present in Hong Kong. Lots of brands. Um, set up corners or shops in Hong Kong uh, to train, to get used to the um, context. These 
shops are often located in shopping malls. You like to stroll down city streets. In Asia, they like to stroll through shopping malls. Why? Because it's practical, easy to access, lots of product offering. You can find everything you're looking for. It's an effective retail model. The problem for brands, though, is that rent is very high. You pay between 500 uh, and 1,000 euros per square meter per month. So you've got to sell a fair few products. When your average um, purchase isn't that high, it's easy for luxury brands, but for smaller brands, more difficult. It's a real challenge. The alternative, you've got shops and shops and department stores. You've also got the option of setting up a high street store. We did this um, at uh, Cordelier. We got a really pleasant surprise as to the, um, how well received this was. You have to also tailor your product offering, the way you do things, your image, but keep your genetic makeup, your uh, DNA. You're a French brand, and they love French brands. Keep this as a competitive edge. Use your teams, but challenge the, the, the teams. Uh, Asian, uh, our Asians can be highly disciplined, model um, employees respectful of management, executive level, more difficult to get them to express their ideas because they're afraid of losing face uh, to their uh, bosses and uh, fellow employees. Uh, but you have to help them speak their minds and join in the corporate project. You've got to bring them into the strategic loop. You've got to involve them in brainstorming. Another challenge with your employees will be to get them to be loyal. Hong Kong is a full employment marketplace, so employee loyalty uh, can be very fragile. It's infrequent for me to uh, find people who don't jump from one company every two, three years, uh, one company to another. I don't have any miracle recipe. We try to empower employees, um, involve them in brainstorming, get them involved. We've got long-term incentives established uh, on, with common uh, shared goals. We can invite them to France, to Bordeaux. It's an exceptional place. They're touched and they love this. Um, and they want to stay on board. And they can meet the owners of the brand who are very accessible people and so forth. I've almost finished. So lastly, let me say that Hong Kong for business is a very effective place to be. The infrastructure is very much fine-tuned. This way you can develop your brand uh, for the long haul. For employees, a dynamic, very pleasant, exciting city, easy to live in, whether you're married or coming with your family. So Hong Kong is attracting more and more people all the time, more and more highly talented people, but there's still room, especially for French businesses, because we have major advantages, added value, major added value in terms of creativity, our expertise, know-how, and the glamour that we still do reflect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cécile. Nous vous retrouvons dans quelques minutes lors du débat. Euh, en attendant, euh, nous restons toujours dans la beauté. No, thank you, Cécile. Uh, we're still in uh, beauty products, but we're going to talk about shopping and gastronomy with Ariane Zaguri who has set up uh, Rue Madame Fashion Group, uh, which owns boutiques in uh, Hong Kong and Macau and is uh, creating another one in Singapore. She has a degree from the Indofian University, and she started in a bank in New York. She started to work as a banker. Then Credit Suisse, uh, Rothschild, Goldman Sachs, and then she arrived in Hong Kong where well, she started to want to be an in, uh, entrepreneur. So she set up a concept store, Rue Madame, and uh, later her company became a dynamic retail group, opening its own concept stores. And recently it opened a restaurant, which is a franchise from the Entrecote, a French restaurant in Paris. It opened recently in Hong Kong. She's a member of the chamber board, and uh, she's also a, um, an advisor for an external trade. Good afternoon. I'm going to be brief because a lot of smart uh, issues have been addressed uh, in a smart way, so I'm uh, not going to repeat what my friends already said. To start with, I would like to uh, tell you my story, if you allow me because I believe that my story is typical of my um, host country. It's a Hong Kong st story. I used to be a banker with Goldman Sachs in London, and I was quite a bit bored. So when I was promoted, I knew that my career as a banker was over. So my husband and I decided to leave London, and we arrived in 2008 in Hong Kong. Why Hong Kong? 
because we, both of us, were fascinated by this country. We could have gone to Tokyo. It was an option, but we felt that we would be more integrated in Hong Kong and uh, we could have a better opportunity for development and a better life. So 2008, Hong Kong, I had left my job at, with Goldman Sachs. I arrived uh, uh, highly pregnant, and after I, uh, my baby was born, I, something happened in Hong Kong for me. And first of all, I, uh, ad I had an opportunistic approach as far as um, company, uh, companies are concerned. In France, we had uh, affordable luxury brands, which were uh, becoming very fashionable. But in Hong Kong, there was a lot of uh, there were a lot of luxury shops and also mass market shops like Zara. But there were no modern brands uh, that I wanted to buy, and I decided to set up my small company. In this way, in 2010, I uh, established Rue Madame, which is a concept store, a boutique, aiming at uh, re being a showcase of authentic French fashion for the Hong Kong citizens. Authentic or genuine means that uh, you will find the same kind of supply in um, brands as in a Saint-Germain store in uh, Paris. A lot of Chinese uh, brand, brands in Hong Kong claimed to be French, but they were not. So we really um, showed to the Hong Kong citizens what the French brands were. And it was specifically for the Hong Kong customers that was, uh, that was the key to our success. We did not want to specifically to sell to expatriates. We wanted specifically or more specifically to sell to the Hong Kong customers because there are more customers in Hong Kong. But we didn't specifically want to sell those brands to the Chinese customers because we didn't, couldn't afford to communicate uh, in China. But we also thought that the Chinese women well, would not spend for affordable luxury goods. And uh, we probably were right because little by little we opened other stores and little by little we understood that it's all very well to sell many brands, multiple brands, but it's complicated to manage and we became the partner of French and now uh, British brands uh, in order to open a single brand store in Macau and Hong Kong, Claudie Pierlot, American Vintage and others, other brands. And recently with partners, we have opened our first concept store uh, in catering. What is most important during the last few years uh, is to be genuine. That is to say that when you go to our restaurant or to our stores, you have the same feeling as uh, if you were in Paris in those uh, same stores. And uh, it, over the past years, we have hired about 100 employees. We have opened about 20 stores. We have sold some of the stores. And uh, we made it possible for, for many French brands to have a showcase in Asia, or whether in multi-brand or single-brand stores. So we are going uh, very soon to open a store in Macau and another one in Singapore. In a nutshell, this adventure was made possible uh, thanks to eight factors. Eight is a lucky figure in China. Now, first of all, to do business in Hong Kong is simple. Uh, you have to be hardworking, but it's, it, um, it is um, worth it. We do not pay VAT. Uh, the red tape is, uh, there is practically no red tape when you set up a shop in Hong Kong. And uh, between the time when the goods leave our suppliers uh, on Friday morning and the time when it arrives in our store, three days have elapsed. Very often, the goods leave Paris on Friday morning and arrive on Monday morning in our stores. Because in Hong Kong, the uh, customers are sophisticated and, and we have to be responsive. 
Now, Hong Kong is a small market and also a large market. It's densely populated, but it's rather small. In order to be visible, you don't need to open um, five stores. You don't have to, to, to open 20 stores. You, five stores are, uh, is enough. Now, what is important in the retail business is location, location, and location. So the Hong Kong people are very sophisticated indeed. They um, travel a lot, they like European brands, and they like to consume a lot. So we have to take advantage from that very sophisticated, uh, from those very sophisticated customers, and also there are lots of tourists. More than 50 million tourists come to Hong Kong per year. Not a lot can afford to buy in our stores, but even a small part of them is enough for us. Moreover, we all benefit from this very fine French image and reputation. As a French woman, I am perceived as a sophisticated Paris dweller, and uh, the French brands are very, very attractive for their Hong Kong customers. But of course, it's not enough to be French. Uh, we we need to. Uh, supply high quality products. Now, the f fifth factor is team spirit. In our company, we've been up to we've had up to 100 employees, and the employees are really feel that they work all for the good of the company. They are aware of the fact that if the company is successful, their career is going to benefit from that success. It's very good for the manager. Entrepreneurship is uh, very highly valued in Hong Kong. Now, nowadays, uh, we have engaged in fa into fashion and catering, but in the future, it could be hairdressing or cosmetics. And in uh, Hong Kong, if you are ambitious and multidisciplinary, you are highly valued. Now, when I arrived to in Hong Kong, I didn't know anything about retail or fashion. In a few years, thanks to Invest Hong Kong, to the Chamber of Commerce, to the French Consulate, I learned a lot. I have been able to set up a wide-ranging network. And I've been able to find a good lawyer, to find the mall, so to find good logistical experts. Now I'm going to speak as, a, as the mother of two children, so it's, uh, I'm quite busy, but I know that I um, give my children a good opportunity um, in Hong Kong. My six-year-old uh, um, daughter is almost trilingual, and uh, both of them, both children, uh, grow up in a very secure environment. Of course, it's a very busy life, but they are going to have, uh, when they leave Hong Kong, they are going to have a cultural and international um, knowledge. Now, you, the first um, problem is that you shouldn't rest on, uh, on your laurels. Uh, everything goes very quickly in Hong Kong. It's not because you're successful today that you're going to be successful in the future. So you have to be hardworking and on, on your toes all the time. Uh, you have to invest in your brand, whether it's British or French. You have DNA. You have to change your. Yeah, it's not a good idea to change uh, the size or the presentation mode. So you have to keep your DNA. But you shouldn't feel that you have the answer to every problem just because you have opened up uh, three stores. PR is important. Some brands can uh, develop very well in Europe with very low-level uh, low communication. It's not possible in Hong Kong. Of course, you should make a distinction between the Chinese customer and then the Hong Kong customer. They have completely different um, purchasing practices. The Hong Kong customer uh, come to our store alone, and she doesn't have to find the right brand. She will buy on an impulsive, uh, or in an impulsive way. The Chinese uh, ladies will come in group, and they have a list of uh, shopping to do. So they are not going to uh, give an equal opportunity to all the brands. 
We are a Hong Kong distributor. We are developing our business on other markets. This does not prevent us from opening our eyes on what is happening in other markets in Asia. For instance, nowadays, Chinese and Hong Kong people are very much um, influenced by, by what is happening in Korea, much more than in Japan. So for the last the past six months, our turnover went up thanks to a jewelry brand that we have discovered in Korea. We were lucky enough to have exclusivity on that jewelry brand. It had an, a huge impact on our turnover. So you have to be on the lookout. Moreover, you have to remember that rents are expensive in Hong Kong. So. It's difficult to open a store if you do not have the necessary funds. For instance, we open the most expensive flagship store in the world, and it costs us 80,000 euros a, a month for the for renting the store. So, in a nutshell, uh, competition is very positive but very harsh. Do not forget the English motto, no pain, no gain. And in conclusion, um, I'm very sincere in my speech to you. My entrepreneur's adventure has been made possible only because I was based in Hong Kong. I used to be a small scale 30 years old, year old banker, and I have been able to change into a serial entrepreneur. So thank you to Hong Kong. Merci, Ariane. Je suis sûr que vous êtes absolument enthousiasmé maintenant. Thank you, Ariane. Very enthusiastic to hear from these people from different uh, sectors, very different profiles, and so forth. But each of them has been successful uh, with their business project. So the next thing for you to do will be for you, in turn, to find your project for Hong Kong. And the best address for this, of course, will be Invest Hong Kong. And we have uh, with us today Simon Galpin, who's uh, the Director General of investment promotion at Invest Hong Kong, the official governmental organization in charge of promoting foreign investments in Hong Kong. He came to Investment Hong Kong as Deputy Managing Director for Investment Promotion in 2001 after a career in the UK. Simon has an MBA from the University of Sheffield uh, School a science degree from the University of Glasgow, and business law, international business law degree from the University of London. So with all that, he uh, came to Invest Hong Kong, where in 2013, among others, he began an operation uh, to assist venture capitalists called Smart Start Me Up Hong Kong, and I think he's going to be talking to you about that and everything that Invest Hong Kong can do to assist you in establishing yourself. Simon, you have the floor. Merci, Paul. Uh, bon après-midi. Uh, excuse me for using English for this presentation. We've had some excellent presentations from some entrepreneurs who've actually voted with their feet and set up businesses in Hong Kong. Uh, as a government uh, employee, I will try to keep the propaganda to a minimum. But I would like to summarize three opportunities that have really emerged in Hong Kong for French businesses over the last decade. The first is that whilst Hong Kong is an economy of seven million people, it's an integral part of a region that could be considered the world's biggest city. The area in Guangdong that surrounds Hong Kong and Macau, an area we call the Greater Pur of a Delta, has a population of 75 million, same as France. It exports more than Italy or France. It has a GDP bigger than Indonesia or Turkey, yet it's very compact. It's smaller than Ireland, smaller than Panama, smaller than West Virginia in the US. And so for business people that want to begin to access the China market, they have to realize that China is one country 
but it's not one market. It's a continental-sized economy. And in the same way for a Chinese entrepreneur coming to Europe, you'd think they were crazy if they went into every single European country with the same pricing strategy, the same marketing pitch, the same marketing model. The same is true of China. You have to start somewhere. But starting in the greater Pura Delta through Hong Kong, we think is as good a place to start as any because it's a compact urban environment of early adopters and wealthy consumers. The second opportunity I'd like to touch on, and it's been brought up by a number of the speakers earlier, is really that business to consumer opportunity. And it stems from the fact that Hong Kong has a lot of wealthy people, but in the areas around Hong Kong, we have even more high net worth individuals. The number of high net worth individuals in Asia exceeds that of Europe, exceeds that of North America, and they're increasingly mobile. So we've heard that Hong Kong received 54 million visitors, and we've heard that those visitors come to shop. And so it's no accident that you see tremendous concentrations of the brands, the products, the services that that wealthy segment of China's population want to buy. And so, you know, we've got, I won't mention French brands, but you've got more Burberrys than you'll see in London, you've got more Gucci's than you'll see in Milan in a very compact environment in Hong Kong. And so for any French company that has a business to consumer offer, you don't have to open up right across China. Start in Hong Kong, it's a very visible location, and those wealthy consumers will come to you. The final opportunity I'd like to touch on is really more of a business to business opportunity. Because at Invest Hong Kong, we don't just help foreign companies to set up and expand in Hong Kong. A big part of our work now is bringing those mainland enterprises, the state-owned enterprises, the privately-owned enterprises, to use Hong Kong as that springboard to go global. But why do they come to Hong Kong? Well, certainly they come to raise capital, but they increasingly come because we have a tremendous pool of business and professional talent. And mainland companies come to Hong Kong, they set up an office in Hong Kong, but they draw on that tremendous pool of talent. We have 70 of the world's top 100 law firms. We've got accounting firms, consulting firms that can provide specialist advice for those companies investing into key locations in Europe, Latin America, Africa, anywhere in the world. And so for French service providers, whether you are in the financial services industry, whether you are a law firm or a consulting firm, but more importantly, if you're a design firm, Hong Kong can be a great place where you can partner with those state and privately owned enterprises and then help them to invest here in France and the rest of Europe. Now, Hong Kong is known to be a place for big multinationals. You know that Schneider and companies like uh, Nissan, Carlos Ghosn of Infinity, has moved their global functions into Hong, Kong, into Hong Kong. But a biggest part of our work right now is not helping the big guys, it's helping individual founders and entrepreneurs from Europe and North America and Australia to set up and start brand new businesses in Hong Kong. And it's taken us as a government almost by surprise that we've seen such rapid growth in the number of startups. In 2010, there were three co-work spaces in Hong Kong, catering for the international startup community. Three and a half years later, we've got well over 30. We believe that although Hong Kong's starting a little bit later and from a lower base, we have one of the fastest startup communities in the world, and the French startup community is a very, very important part. When we look at who's applying for investor visas to start their businesses, as we've heard today, for the first time, France has moved up the ranks and is now number two. Only India has more investor entrepreneurs than France in Hong Kong, and France has overtaken the United States, Japan, the UK, Germany, all those other economies. So we've got a very, very vibrant startup community in Hong Kong, and I hope we at Invest Hong Kong
can support you to do the same thing. Thank you very much. Merci à tous. Oh, Simon, I will, I will ask you to, uh, to stay on stage if you want. And, uh, and thank you very much for these uh, uh, tips on, uh, on Hong Kong. Um, I will ask the, the other uh, speakers to come back on stage uh, for the, the next part of our session, which will be the debate. Um, I remind you that you have uh, question forms which are available if you want to write your questions and send them to us through the, through the staff. Uh, please don't hesitate. I think we have quite a few already. Well, let's, let's uh, start the debate once everybody is sitting with a, a very simple question first uh, to all of you. Why did you choose Hong Kong? Why not Singapore? Why not Shanghai? Uh, any particular reason? Uh, we've heard some uh, reasons which have been mentioned, but um, who would like to start? Jacques, would you like to... Uh, to we'll start on that point. Est-ce que je peux répondre en français? Can I answer that in French? I work for a French group in Africa that had business in Asia, and I actually got to Hong Kong, got to Asia by accident to manage their activities there. Now the decision to actually stay in Hong Kong and begin business there was after seven years that I'd already spent there. And it was basically uh, thanks to the experience I'd had over the seven years. I traveled a lot throughout Asia, and it made perfect sense to me to choose Hong Kong to set up a business. You, you're surrounded uh, by people who've uh, been involved in business. There's that whole business momentum in Hong Kong. It's amazing. And you are just thrilled with that. And you really think, why can't I then? They can do it. Why can't I do it too? It's a real gut feeling that you get. It's not something you think through carefully necessarily. It's a gut feeling. It's something you want to do. And then you consider how to do it and figure out how to do it. That's how it happened with me. It really uh, was a gut feeling I got to really stay in Hong Kong. Yes, as I was saying, we had a choice between Tokyo and Hong Kong. Uh, my husband still a banker looking for a major banking center. And in Tokyo, we got the impression we would never be able to integrate. And I wanted to also set up my own business, and I don't think it would have been possible to do it this way, to set up a business this way in Tokyo. Well, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Singapore are the three choices you've mentioned. Well, easy. If you love a city's energy, you want to go to Hong Kong. Singapore is calmer, quieter. You can do a little bit more tourism. Shanghai, I found it was a high-energy city, but it didn't have the same positive energy as Hong Kong. That was my view. It seemed more tiring, but not for the right reasons. It wasn't stimulating. Because, of course, I went to these various cities. I took a look-see before deciding, opting for Hong Kong. What brought me to Hong Kong was love, not the love of someone, but the love of, for the city. I went for a three-day weekend there 10 years ago. I, went to, I was located in Beijing at the time, and I went to, to travel briefly to Hong Kong to visit Hong Kong. And I can't tell you exactly what transpired, but once I left there, I thought, if I've only got one life, which is my belief, I've got to come back, spend some of my life in Hong Kong. And then I managed to organize things and create my own opportunities so that I could get back to Hong Kong with a project, a different project. But it was the city itself I fell in love with and the energy that attracted me. Thank you. Okay, we have a lot of questions. I'm trying to uh, group them together. One of them for Igor. And let me actually merge it together with several other questions. The basic idea is this. What's the competitive advantage for a French startup? 
so France's image. Does, the, does that help you develop business in the region? Um, isn't there more of an Anglo-Saxon influence and image in the region? How do you manage uh, culture, c c conflict of culture between uh, French and Hong Kong culture? Sorry, Simon, we're in some risky Franco-British territory asking about differences in British and French culture. To laugh back in French. More generally speaking, though, what's the competitive edge uh, you've got if you're French in Hong Kong? And let me add an attack on question to that. What's the image? Because in your case, you're making Hong Kong products. And what's the image, as you see it, of products that are made in Hong Kong? Is that a plus or a minus in, in your global marketing? There are lots of questions you've clustered together into one. Let me begin by talking about uh, the plus of being French in our uh, business. It's true, there's this image of luxury, you know, at every level of industry, even at our level, where we're talking more about electronics, but sort of high-end electronics. As soon as you come along, even to a supplier, uh, they immediately lend you some extra credibility in terms of aesthetics and style, which may be unjustified. It's just because you're French that you've got good taste. But they feel like, they think that P potentially your brand is going to develop well and have a positive international impact and so forth. So it's, it, we're lucky. We're lucky when we're French in this respect. This is uh, the view people have of us and the view the Chinese have of us. Next question, you're asking me how to manage that conflict, Franco-British, because we've got a British uh, partner. There could be a conflict, but there's not. In the morning, you'll, you may laugh or not, but in the morning, we don't say good morning, we, say, we, don't say, we don't say bonjour, we say bon matin, good morning, uh, sort of franglais. So it's um, co conflict, you know, have to turn conflict into something positive. So John's British, but with, we're talking about the same thing with all the nationalities that are part of our development now, uh, Native Union Hong Kong. We've made everything gel, blend, we've got a platform that makes me sort of think of offices you might see in Silicon Valley, where these are very open offices, very much about participation, not conflict, but mutual enrichment. Yes, we're all speaking Cantonese to each other. Another question for Jacques Boissier is related. Um, an understanding of English. Uh, is it enough to just understand English to work with other businesses? Um, is it an impediment to commercial development if you don't speak a local language? Next, a gourmet high-end product. Can it be sold three times more uh, from three times more money in Hong Kong than in France? Third point, is it necessary to subcontract um, the registration of premium products in Hong Kong? So very precise questions there. Well, the first one, no, it's not indispensable to speak Cantonese in Hong Kong. I don't speak Cantonese. I just know how to use some of the cuss words in taxis. That's basically all my Cantonese. So no, you don't have to. They're highly international. English uh, is very much a, a shared language, but you do have to. Sometimes I see young French people come along to Hong Kong that don't speak English, and I say to them, look, you've got to go learn English first, then come to Hong Kong or to the region. You've got to have a good understanding of English, otherwise you won't be able to go international here. In China, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, in negotiations, it's, inter it's good, to, good to speak, but I don't speak uh, Chinese. You don't have to. I have employees who are bilingual, and they help me. Sometimes it's a plus to not understand the language. The other side may see it as a plus. They may be, um, it may be problematic in negotiations if you speak the same language. Another question was what? Second question about and re registrations. In Hong Kong, you don't have to register products unless they are uh, dairy products. In that case, you do have to register the product and get a license. Import of food products is easy. There are no taxes, no customs duties. You just need a health certificate for any um, uh, fresh products, except for dairy products, that's more complicated, but you can still get the go-ahead pretty easily. It's very simple. It's not at all the same uh, issue that you may encounter in China. Can you sell things for three times more money? No, you can't. Uh, uh, multiply your price by three. No, uh, you mustn't dream. Today, if you go to a supermarket, it may be more expensive than in France because um, there's a duopoly. There are two supermarket chains, basically, of course, there's no uh, 
entente, but if I sell a product for 10, they sell it for 20, and they have very high margins. But if you look at hotels and restaurants, basically prices are similar uh, to the uh, price in Paris because there's no VAT. So we mustn't dream. You can't just multiply your prices by three when you export. No, you have to be highly competitive. You have to be good. You've got to have good cost structures. Uh, it's a highly competitive world out there. You can't just sell at any old price. Often I hear people say, the exporters saying, I want to sell you for more at a higher price because you're in a remote market. You can't do it that way. It doesn't work. Cecile. Is language a barrier? Is it an issue? Have you encountered problems? And a more specific question for you. You talked to us about um, adapting, tailoring products, and also keeping your genetic makeup. Could you talk to us more about that, What, uh, how you can reconcile these two aspects? Firstly, I would say the same thing Jack says. Language is not a problem. All of our negotiations have been in English. All the people you meet, even in Korea or in China, uh, you can easily do negotiations with them in English. Next point. As to our brand's genetic makeup, if you've got a great French brand, I agree with Ariane, you have to maintain it. You have to keep uh, the codes uh, in your brand, but at the same time, adapt to the Asian standards. In this instance, um, for Code Lely, we changed nothing. We didn't change our products. The products are very much in line with uh, Asian requirements as well. We've got a whitening range that's um, uh, much less abrasive than the Japanese or Korean uh, product lines that the Asians like very much. There's a whole market for natural products and soft cosmetics, uh, which uh, have become very popular. Next. We really, you have to really capitalize on your brand, its strengths, build on them, just tailor them so the Asians understand them appropriately. We have a slogan at Kodali that Asians don't understand. Well, you've got to change the slogan then. That's what you have to do, these minor adaptations. Everything else, though, I would say keep the way you are. Keep your edge of being made in France. It's very important, I think. Uh, Ariane, uh, Ariane, a question about retailing. This person is positively surprised by your success, whereas people say that rent is so high in Hong Kong that it kills off small retailers. Uh, what's your recipe? Also, how much is uh, your um, rent at the prime location? Maybe you don't have to actually reveal everything. But uh, also, question, what are the various formulas you're proposing to your partners to um, go to Hong Kong. Well, first of all, I wanted to come back to a point, I'm sorry to backtrack, but a point you brought up about prices. This is a very important issue for us as well. Yes, brands tend to think that you can triple or quadruple prices in Hong Kong. I say absolutely not. That is a strategy we've developed in our group to keep uh, pretty much aligned with France. Not always entirely possible for two reasons, though. Unfortunately, Rent is an issue. Yes, it's true. Rent is very high. You've got to pay that rent. But there's another reason, which hasn't yet been mentioned here. VIP discounts in Hong Kong, it's very important to, to give face to the customer. In, in, in clothing stores, basically all of Hong Kong gives VIP discounts. Basically all the brands do this. So people expect this. They expect 10% discount almost everywhere. And if you do the sums at the end of the year, that has a huge impact on your margin. So all the prices you see in Hong Kong, basically you've already got to cut them by 10% right off the bat because that's the price uh, that the retailer really expects to get for these. But to come back to your other questions, yes, rent is high, but as I said earlier, we're small, so you've got a smaller location and higher performance. We have had some hiccups along the way. These are negatives. But all in all, out of the 20 stores we've opened, they were all profitable because there's a reason the locations are expensive. And in basically all cases, when we work with international brands, almost all of our stores 
were in the top five in terms of um, sales, revenues for their brands. So rent is high, but high performance locations. Unfortunately, I can't actually reveal uh, the prices. We did open a lot of stores. All I can tell you is that we opened, what, six or seven stores now in the IFC, and they always were pro have been profitable. Never an, an issue. So yes, costly, but they ask for a lot of money, but they're right. Last point, formulas, uh, local and regional distributors and a brand. Well, there's no one single answer. We have lots of different formulas, so to speak. It ranges from franchises to joint ventures uh, to retail distribution contracts. The only thing, um, we tend to prefer alignment of interests between the brand and us. In other words, whether we're talking about a, a, I don't know, a joint venture or other contractual terms, it's a highly competitive market in Hong Kong. And like in any association, in any marriage, you like to make sure that you're working hand in hand and not against each other. Thank you. We've got several questions I'd like to cluster together as well here that have to do with financing of development in Hong Kong, so funding, and especially access to venture capital, private equity, um, incubators, um, seed capital, and so forth. I suspect Simon would be the best person to uh, field these questions. Well, you know, one of the reasons why we want to celebrate all the startups that are setting up in Hong Kong from all around the world is, A, we want to bring in more entrepreneurs, B, we want to make it cool for talented young people to work for startups, and see, most importantly, we want to encourage many of those high net worth individuals to become angel investors and support the startups that we have in Hong Kong and around Hong Kong. Um, th there's an awful lot of money in Hong Kong, um, and it seems to be that for many of our startups, they find access to that seed funding okay. But because so many of our startups of this new wave are less than two years old, we're not really sure whether we're going to have a big challenge when it comes to that more serious Series A funding. Um, we don't have that many venture capitalists, um, but uh, some of the venture capital firms from Silicon Valley that first opened in Beijing are now starting to open up and expand into Hong Kong. Um, because for many of these companies, the exit maybe a listing in Hong Kong or a trade sale in Hong Kong. So uh, access to finance is actually a, a, a selling point and a reason why many startups from Israel are beginning to look at Hong Kong, but we've still got to try and join the dots and make sure the angel investors and the potential angel investors know about the startup opportunities. Okay, I think we, we can uh, also mention the role played uh, by Cyberport, for instance, uh, where they have uh, seed money for uh, startups. Uh, the Science Park also has uh, preferential rates for startups in the, in the technology field. Uh, at the French Chamber, we in fact started a, a, a group which we call the BAG, the Business Advisory Group. Dont, uh, sorry, je sais plus si je parle en anglais ou en français. Uh, Ariane en, en fait partie. Ariane is a member of that. And the origin of that group, well, that was during the 2008 crisis when at the Chamber of Commerce we decided to set up a, a crisis think tank for SMEs to help the SMEs that were in trouble. We assisted them, we gave them advice. This led to an initiative of business angels. Ariane can talk to you about this in greater detail. Yes, just briefly. The BAG, well, we're a whole series of uh, business people plus some bankers, I believe. People will come to us with their business project at various stages along the way. And we then try uh, to spend a couple of hours and give them advice. Generally, I mean, yes, it's true. Sometimes it'll be explaining how to raise money and from whom. We try to guide them. Or maybe we'll help them meet with distributors. We meet with a whole range of different types of companies. Also, more and more tech companies, that's right. I really do believe, yes, uh, this is beneficial. Another example, Cecile talked about this. Mutual assistance 
from within the French community. This is a very great example, very pro highly professionally done. Yes, Jacques, I'd like to add a brief point. There's a French community which has been successful in making businesses in Hong Kong. Interesting to observe, several members of the community are very readily assisting newcomers. It's coming very naturally. There's no actual benefit structure as such. And these aren't angels as such. These are people, private individuals, who think, well, I've been pretty successful. I've got a little bit of money. Here's a youngster coming along. They need 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 euros, and I'll help them out. I'm seeing this happen more and more in Hong Kong. Often it's people who use the BAG and the chamber. They got advice, um, and then they'll find assistance in the first, they'll find someone to help out in the first phase, something I hadn't seen previously in France. Um, Often individuals don't come along in an unstructured way to just help someone out during the first stage. Also, there's assistance available through the Hong Kong government, for instance, uh, to help SMEs. It's available as uh, SME funding. There are also government guarantees, those partial guarantees. In addition to that, a technology fund program there are matched subsidies for R&D investment. Simon, could you come in on that? Certainly for companies that want to do R&D, there's matching funding, as you say. It's not just SMEs. It's any size company now is eligible for that funding, which is quite generous. But for any company that wants to market their products on the mainland, if you have an office in Hong Kong, you can use something called the BUD funding, which is... Uh, basically aimed at small and medium-sized companies, but it means that if you want to attend exhibitions in Shanghai, if you want to develop marketing materials to promote your products in, in mainland China, the Hong Kong government will give you uh, a rebate of 50% of that cost. So again, there's lots of schemes there, not just to help you to set up in Hong Kong, but to then access the mainland market too. Yeah, I must say we use this uh, facility for... for uh um, not only for um, uh, exhibitions, but also uh, when you uh, register a patent, uh, the cost of registration of the patent is uh, shared with uh, or subsidized uh, halfway by the government. So you have a number of uh, helps you can get uh, on this, uh, on this uh, sector. Um, one question I wanted to, uh, to raise uh, maybe with Igor is uh, the question of uh, protection of intellectual property. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, problems in China with uh, IP, uh, both in the technological, uh, technological field and in the luxury sector. How do you cope with this in your uh, very innovative uh, sector? Are you copied? Are you, uh, how do you fight? Is Hong Kong a good place to do that? Alors, on est copié, on est extrêmement copié. Euh, souvent, les gens vous disent ah. We 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 are copied. Uh, sometimes people uh, tell us uh, we see your products everywhere. It's not good news. It's not good news. And sometimes uh, people say you are in Hong Kong, you uh, will have more. It's more likely that you will be copied. No, no, it's not because we're in Hong Kong. It's because we have good products that sold well, and that uh, the counterfeiters in China decide that it's going to be the target uh, counterfeited product uh, for the next few months. So it's not because you are Hong in Hong Kong that you will be more copied. The legal environment in Hong Kong makes it possible for us to have easy access to lawyers and to legal protection that is subsidized by the Hong Kong government that um, urges us to file patents for our drawings, models, and, and uh, uh, designs. And the costs are lower than in Europe. Legal costs are lower. Are lower. For instance, if you file a patent for a design or a model, you have a priority for six months before filing a patent in the rest of the world. Hong Kong is considered as a country. And for four or 500 euros, it's possible to file a patent that is going to give us a priority for six months. And we have six months uh, to see whether the product is going to be successful or not, and whether we want to file a patent in, uh, on the international level. So things are made easier by Hong Kong. Cecile, 
in the fashion or cosmetics business or beauty business? Do you have that kind of problem? Um, intellectual property? Well, everything is uh, done in France. We haven't found a copy yet, but there are similar products. However, at Caudalie, we're protected. Uh, let me go back to what Ariane was telling you. If you have a poor pricing policy, if you sign with distributors in China, Hong Kong, or any other countries in the world, and uh, they increase your prices, then you are going to uh, make it easier for counterfeit products to appear or similar products to emerge. At Caudalie, we made a mistake in the beginning. A distributor had taken over our brand, had increased our prices by 50% uh, compared with uh, French prices. And when we had to regulate the prices, it was very difficult because the consumers are used to uh, uh, having a certain price. And if you lower the price, they feel that the brand is failing. So we took advantage of each launch of a new a beauty product, a new formula of a beauty product in order to reposition our prices. But I can assure you that uh, this is a, a mistake that you have to avoid right from the start. Jacques, what about counterfeit foie gras? Now, there's a problem with wine. I don't do business in the wines. But it's a real problem in China. In Hong Kong, a Mouton Rothschild, a bottle is sold at 100 US dollars and then it's exported to China. It's um, bottled in another bottle and then it comes back to Hong Kong. So break your bottle when you finish your uh, bottle of wine. Uh, drink when you've drunk up your bottle of wine. So we can see a few counterfeit milk products, VV products for baby food. And uh, in China, people only have one child, and they uh, uh, want the best product for their child. So there are counterfeit products uh, for milk, infant milk. I've seen counterfeit pasta or oil for uh, uh, low price products and expense, inexpensive products. The main problem is parallel products. It's very dangerous because uh, you can't be sure about the uh, that the cold chain has been complied with. So for a French industrialist, it's a major problem. So we have to choose the right distributor and hunt for parallel products and circuits because uh, we can, you can be sure that, it, that in those circuits, the product is of uh, uh, lower quality. Ariane, do you want to add something? Uh, I concur with, with what has been said by my colleagues. Concerning fashion, the fashion business, um, brands are more and more successful. And of course, we have to face this kind of issue. Each time we had to face this kind of problem, for instance, Maj uh, dresses that were found with uh, Stella McCartney uh, labels in the center of Hong Kong. But a lawyer's letter was enough to make the model disappear. There, the distributor's role is very important to hunt uh, for the um, counterfeited products. Another question concerning human resources and the uh, job opportunities for young French people in Hong Kong. Do the French companies uh, still hire French people for the past uh, years, the French expatriates in Hong Kong have gone up. Is there still some room for newcomers? Uh, concerning the Chamber of Commerce, we have a job uh, unit in the Chamber of Commerce, uh, placing about 150 French people in Hong Kong, not necessarily uh, with uh, French companies. It all depends on the skills of uh, the job seekers. Another question concerns training. And diplomas that are particularly uh, looked after or thought after in Asia. Are there problems in the communication business? Uh, 
Yes, yeah, some companies are really successful in uh, communication. A French um, woman has been very successful in the um, communication and uh, event organization business. We receive a lot of requests for internships from young uh, French students. And uh, within the chamber, we have set up a specific interns or, um, or trainees unit, and it works very well. It's the best way for a, a, an intern to find an internship. There are more than 200 uh, specific um, foreign contracts for young students um, in companies. We sponsor the uh, students. We organize a major VIE award and also a SME award, which is uh, jointly uh, funded by the Chamber and the Development Council, the Hong Kong Development Council. So this is some room for young uh, French people. Now, concerning the interns uh, or trainees, we all receive a lot of requests, but they need a work permit. An intern needs a work permit. permit. So, I, as, as an entrepreneur, I uh, am uh, only going to try and get a work permit if the internship lasts for six months. We see a lot of young people arrive in Hong Kong without any past experience, um, professional experience, but only a diploma. Then it's very difficult uh, nowadays to get a work permit. Uh, you need a diploma, but a minimum of two years past experience. It's even more difficult in China, uh, except if the uh, young man or woman comes from a company directly sent by a company. There had been an agreement between the French government and the Hong Kong government, making it possible for young graduates to come for a year, work in, for, to come to work in Hong Kong for a year. They are entitled to work. They can stay a year in Hong Kong. They will get automatically a work permit. And they are entitled to two different jobs for a year. So, and that way they get started, and after a year, they uh, are entitled to get a work permit. It's called the Working Holiday Visa, and we've just opened a restaurant, and we've realized that in, there are lots of jobs to be uh, filled uh, within the FNB. There are 20,000 jobs which are unfilled yet in Hong Kong, and uh, whether it's in the cooking business or in any other catering business. I think that for um, uh, young people with experience, there still is some margin of maneuver. If you develop a brand in France and in a subsidiary in Asia, it's very important for the people in the uh, French headquarter to be able to communicate with a French person. Uh, things are easier that way. We have jobs. Uh, in the marketing area for the local people. And for the uh, trade and business, uh, French people are very good. At a regional level, it's good to have a, a sales delegate. And it's the type of profile, profile, French profile that we need. Igor, what's the uh, profile of the people that you hire? Well, we look for creative people, designers, graphic designers, product designers. We had a sales intern recently. And it's great to be able to uh, travel for six months uh, around Southeast Asia. He had to go back to Europe. He didn't have a choice, but he wanted to return to Hong Kong as soon as possible. Unfortunately, we're getting to the end of our session. I would like to thank all the participants, and I would like a round of applause for them.